Mangi, who's a senior investment analyst at Cyton with us. I have Paula Fuller, who is not new to our screens, and he's uh, the business editor at the Daily Nation. And next to him is another man who's not new to our screens either, Tony Watimo, who's an economist and a columnist. Thank you for joining us. And I think, let me just begin with the lady. What are your general thoughts on what you've had being said in Moranga? And we are likely to get a few more comments from different parts of the country, as well as um, just a general feeling. Is the economy doing that badly, or is it just that the bad things have gotten more platformed? Um, thank you, Dan. Plus, um, I think I 100% concur with them. The economy has not been performing as well as it has been in the yesteryears. And we've had so many challenges. Uh, and as you can see, they're mainly highlighting on these small and medium enterprises. I think they've suffered the most this year. OK. Yep. Paul, what, what's your comment on that? See, when you look at, when you sit here in Nairobi, 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 Nairobi
is at a dead end where you see everyone is talking about that there is no money in circulation. Mm. And so that's the thing that we, we don't see being addressed. And that's the reason why I say that uh, the future is gloomy, that for the coming years, we're just seeing the beginning of it. So, you know, we are seeing um, people just saying the same. For instance, the, the gentleman from Muranga, he's saying that he's basically making about a third of what he was making before. He said this to make about 13,000, or they're doing three, 4,000, which roughly comes to about a third of what that, that is. Now, that's, that's one end of the story. Mm -hmm. The other end is we're seeing all these huge events spearheaded either by the president or uh, the deputy president or Raila Odinga in some cases, um, or various ministers where we are seeing significant investments. You know, which the, the government is saying we are putting up this. We've seen CS Munya there, you know, talking about the Nevasha Industrial Park, um, saying that, you know, they already have an, an anchor tenant. You're seeing so many of these huge projects being commissioned or being rolled out and, you know, getting into action. The very investments that are meant to create a more, a, a more, a, a better cash flow, so to speak, you know, to make our pockets not have so many echoes. But what's the disconnect? Where are we seeing this big, I'll begin with you, Beatrice, this big, Plans, this big thing's been announced on the big podium with all the fanfare and the likes. But when, it, when, but when you come down to it, um, and the, there's a concern that we still don't have the money. What's, where, where is there a disconnect? Um, in my view, I think we've, 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 yes, I agree we've had these big events, these major developments being announced here and there. But I don't think we are addressing the issue on the ground. I don't think we're addressing the problem Kamau is facing in Moranga. I don't think he gets to feel the impact of that industrial park yet. Because if you look at what they depend on, for example, look at people uh, who are mainly into agriculture. It's, it's been dropping in terms of GDP uh, contribution, meaning we're not producing as much as we used to. Mm. What is the problem there? I don't think we're yet, we're getting to address that, which is what affects me and you, that is what affects Wanjiko. But if you look at these big developments, the industrial park, as uh, my colleague had mentioned previously, we'll have these tenders go out but who, who gets them? You see, who has the cap capability? It's not that one individual who, um, who probably doesn't even have a company. These standards will go to the Chinese because they have the capability, so they get the money. Uh, a normal monainchi here who is struggling to, to have a boutique work or to have mm. um, his, just some farm produce for his maintenance, is not able to get enough financing, is not able to get business. So trade has been very low, agriculture has been very low, you look at the price of milk. I think those are the issues that affect us on the ground, but that is not what is being addressed. Okay. And Paul, I know you want to comment, but you see, it's also just touching on that. You had also talked about, um, you know, that they're giving the contracts to the Chinese. But isn't it what she's kind of alluded to, that some of the contract capacities, we don't have the capacity. There's no Kenyan firm that has the capacity to actually execute some of these. Uh, would, would it be unfair to, to, to blanketly say that they're giving Chinese, they're not giving Kenyans? At a way we come up on a and you know, there's someone who then have the capacity. Will you give them out of patriotism or out of value? Uh, Dan, this is a tricky situation because you, you're looking at um, at it from um, from a one-off like today. Mm. Uh, you want Kenyans to grow capacity. You want us to be at the same level like the Chinese or the, the Japanese are. If you went to Uganda or Tanzania today, uh, you will not be allowed to do some things that China is doing here today. Because they have realized that you rather be able to incubate your people, train them, and only get somebody when you cannot be able to get the good or service produced in the country. That way, in the long run, you find local capacity is being boosted. And eventually, you become an exporter of this skill that you're actually uh, being able to do. So you need to balance in terms of uh, what are the contracts. Like, for instance, um, the other day, uh, doing something like a fence, you know, a five million contract. But the Chinese do that. Small, small projects that Kenyans can actually be able to do. You know, uh, we've done like 300 kilometers of, uh, of, of railway already. You want to tell me that from that there are not enough people who have learned one or two things, that we can able also to be able to do one or two things. So you need to, to balance that. And, and just to be able to go back the, to, the, to the last question that you asked, Dan, yeah. uh, I will look at it this way. Everything, uh, even the human body, to have a balanced diet, you need all elements. You know, you need to have some carbohydrates, some mm. vitamins, some proteins, right? So even in the economic sense of it, you can't just put all your money or all your resources in one end, which is just infrastructure, because that's not enough. You need to balance this up so that you, you, you put in infrastructure, but also you spare some investments to do a few other things. I mean, if, if, if you look at even just how we spend uh, on our economy, um, 
But those critical areas, done today, uh, a two kilogram packet of, of, of garlic, 135 shillings on average uh, in, in, the, in the supermarket. That is higher than, it's actually more expensive to eat garlic than to, to buy a packet of, of wheat. And that is really crazy because this is like a staple. This is where everybody, every two days, you're going back to buy. So if you want to keep money in the pockets of Kenyans, you make sure that you reduce some of these things. Look at Uganda. Uganda now is a bigger exporter. It's even exporting more coffee than we are doing, yet we are the people who are known for coffee. So the areas that we were actually good at, that we were, those were our, our strengths that were making our economy work, we are losing on that end. The other thing you have to look at, you have a beautiful road, but you need people to use it. You need the vehicles to use it. You have a beautiful standard gauge railway, but you have nothing that you are sending downstream. You have no nothing that you are you you're exporting. So you need to balance that. As you're building the railway uh, up, up into the hinterland, you need to be developing uh, your manufacturing base to be able to, to, to do what? To be able to use this railway. But right now, if you talk to any manufacturer, manufacturers, they're either scaling down or they're thinking about getting out of the country because it's like everything is becoming hard. And uh, Dan, if you went just and spoke to these SMEs, those are the people who are employing most people. In terms of just the business environment, we have very good numbers that are coming up from the World Bank in terms of the ease of doing business. But starting a business in Nairobi even today, in terms of the taxes that you have to pay, I mean, some of them, uh, the corruption that you have to go through to just get yourself done. And when you are starting, there are all these people hanging on your head. I mean, l l you have licenses for almost everything, from noise, from everybody else wants, to, wants some money from you, before you even start. And then when you start, there are no services that come after that. So you are there, you open your shop and it's flooded. You are there, you, you know, uh, before the years, the end, scare is on your neck, breathing, and you have made nothing. So we need to uh, first incubate, yeah, grow. Then when we get to a level whereby we, we are in a position to be able to fund some of these things, we're able to do so. It's a mix of balance. That's why I say let us balance and have a balanced diet, so to speak, for the economy to be able to be useful to Kenyans. Okay, Tony. Um one of the things that has been, you know, mentioned uh, in a number of instances as to why, you know, we don't have as much money is partly because of the government's borrowing. You know, it has affected our, our economy. Yes. Before we even get to the details, I just want for the sake of that person who may not be as conversant, who's watching it, is not as conversant with the economic mm -hmm. um, dynamics. Maybe mm -hmm. just explain mm -hmm. how domestic borrowing, international, foreign borrowing affects mm -hmm. the economy and just uh, the government's performance so that when we discuss it, it becomes something okay. that everyone understands. Okay, L let me try and make it simple. Uh, when Kibaki government was in power, uh, the budget deficit uh, was always around 200 billion. Mm. And so that means mostly the deficit will be financed by borrowing. Mm. So you look at, they will split 100 billion local borrowing, local market, and 100 billion uh, international market. When Jubilee government came in, the deficit moved to the minimum of 400 billion. So when you have 400 billion, it means that will be financed by borrowing. That's a heavy, uh, a heavy deficit that you have. So they started with 200 billion local borrowing, 200 billion foreign borrowing. I think right now we are at a deficit of 600 billion. Uh, and so it means, I think this year we are borrowing around 350, almost 400 billion local market. So what happens is that uh, when government now decides to finance its budget through local borrowing, so they go out and issue a bond, and then the banks, pension funds, and all those kind of come and uh, give money to government. In essence, what we are doing is that we move money from people back to government. And so government puts it on infrastructure projects and all those kind of a thing. Uh, for a growing market, it should be the reverse. That g government is limited, especially in the local market, from borrowing. So that those who have banks, especially, those who have money to lend are able to lend to the public. So that's where SMEs are, the local investors, and those kind of people. So that reverse means that if gov government is borrowing more into the market, it means your interest rate also is determined by government. So if government is giving a lot of interest to those who are loaning them, it means also your interest will go higher, even if you're to borrow because you're borrowing at a risk-free government risk, so you borrow up from government. So that's the problem that we have, in essence. That is one of the biggest problems. So we've crowded out private sector in the local market, borrowing the credit market, and left it to government. So the participation is that, the participation in government, in, in the economy is that government is the biggest participator, rather than the private sector. And that's the biggest problem that we have, that we see private sector looking at private equity funds and all the other local investors. 
than the credit market that we're having today. So unless we address that problem, that is one of the biggest problems that we have since the Jubilee government came in, and it's catching up with us because every year we, 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 we read a bigger budget that we cannot finance, and it means you have to go to the local market. You go and finance the local market, you move out private sector out of the market, participation of private sector goes out. But it needs a balance, even if you're going to the international market to borrow. There are very high risks, especially on the exchange rate risk, when you're going to the international market. And I think we are in such a position. So what we've tried within the Jubilee government, we've borrowed heavily in the local market, we've borrowed heavily in the international market. Uh, so that's the, that's the problem, that is the crux of the matter of the economy that we have today. But to, to answer your question that you asked before, uh, I think the biggest problem that we have first is government participating a lot in the economy. Government is not an investor in the economy. Government is a facilitator. They are able to create a business environment for many investors to come in. But since Jubilee government came, we see they try to be the investor. Uh, and you look at the agricultural market that uh, panelists have mentioned, you trace from Kibaki's government, the more government participates in that sector, the more it continues to fail. Uh, because of inefficiency, they allocate money and they embezzle and they, they don't solve the problem that is there. So when you try to push that market, so they tend to increase the cost of doing business in that sector. So one of that's, well, that's one of the problems that we have. The second problem is about that you, you talk about uh, these projects that we're launching that it doesn't translate to much liquidity. Yes. Economic viability of these projects is one of the main things that is in question. Uh, we've been hev invested heavily in, in infrastructure projects, but most of the mega projects don't have feasibility study, even if they have one. It's one done by the contractor where there's a conflict of interest. <laughs> so they'll always rubber stamp it. Let me give an example of the expressway of Nairobi. We are building an expressway from Westlands to JKIA. Mm. You look at the economic viability of that and what it can mean to the economy at around 60 billion cost. So government is, government is providing 20% plus other infrastructural issues, uh, drainage system and all that, that comes to government side. You look at that project, it doesn't even serve 1% of Kenya's population. Uh, it serves people who are uh, in need of rushing to the, uh, to the airport. <laughs> so 60% of, of Nairobians uh, walk every day. They don't use cars, they don't use a matatu. So we haven't solved the problem that we have in Nairobi. We are saying that we are solving a, a, a congestion and, a, and traffic, but we are not solving that problem. Where would you rather that 60 billion went? Uh, I, I think that 60 billion can be used to try to revamp a railway system that provides uh, better transport, a mass transport system for a lot of people. Mm. Uh, so we need to find that projects are, are able to address, are centered with people. You're solving a problem where there is a majority of people. And that's the biggest problem that we have in, in, in the mega projects that we have. So okay. that viability also is another question. But to, to, to answer the last point is that when you talk about Chinese infrastructure projects, we tend to subsidize Chinese investors. And that is the biggest problem also with the Jubilee government. That you find that first, when they sign these projects, you look at Expressway, you look at the SGR, you look at most of the mega projects. First, they're given tax waivers. Second, they are given... Uh, uh, tax exemptions on inputs they bring. Third, they always bring their own labor. So where is the local addition? Mm. So technically, we are always subsidizing investors, Chinese investors in these projects. And, in the, and the worst part is it's loans that we've taken, okay. and then we subsidize them. So there is no public, no, there is no local participation in terms of scaling, uh, what Paul has talked about, scaling local uh, participation. With it. So you're able to build capacity. That is one of the biggest problems also we need. So that, we, when you negotiate projects also, that's one of the aspects that we need to look okay. at. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Dan, just even to, to jump in there, you, you ask yourself, where is the majority of the population? Where are the people that really need services? Then you start from there. If you went to any populated uh, areas in, in Nairobi, you find they have the poorest of roads, they have the poorest of, um, of, uh, of drainage systems, they have no sewerage, they have no water, those basic things are missing. So if you're even to do your, 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 your BRT, if you are to do your, um, your, your trade, your, your, your commuter uh, train, that, those are the markets that you first target, you're, so that you can able to enable majority of Kenyans who are coming to work 
By doing that, then you save a lot of time wastage on the roads. But now you, you have a beautiful uh, uh, expressway, as it says, that will be very good for the country maybe another 10 years from now. But the people who are really right now suffering are the guys who are walking uh, from Kariobangi, finding, trying to find a train and hanging on it to get to work, you know, so that they can be able to earn the 5,000 or 10,000 they, they make a month. So you need first to enable these people. That is how government should be able to intervene. On the other issue of debt, um, I think just to add on what Watima yes. said, is that debt is always the first charge on, on, on government expenditure. So the more you borrow, it means that um, all the money that you raise, first of all, you must be able to take care of your debt repayment. Mm -hmm. Once you pay your debt, then you're able now to ask yourself, what am I left with? So the moment your debt is so high up, you find that you take away any any ability for you to spend on the development uh, uh, projects that you really have planned. And that's why you keep going back to borrowing. And that is a cycle that will, 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 will forever choke you. So you need to be able to, be, to, to, know, to, to, to balance that, as, as I said, so that you, you don't borrow too much. Borrowing is not necessarily bad, but you also borrow and put it in um, a, a, mean, a, a portfolio of investments that are fast, immediate, and long term. Look at the, the Kibaki administration. They may not have done a lot of infrastructure projects, right? But Kibaki started the free primary education, which costs a fraction of, of, of what we are spending today. Look at the impact it had on the country. He was moving on to the free secondary education. Look at that in terms of impact. And it's a fraction of the budget that we are spending today. It will be like, a, I think, 10% of, uh, of, of the cost of infrastructure we are doing today. And that will put most of Kenyans in school and then give them skills. When they come out, they're able to to be able to boost the same economy. So you want to spend money where it's really going to be able to eventually have a bigger dividend on, 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 on the income, rather than having a project that at the end of the day uh, is, is ghost. Look at uh, our railway that is going to, 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 to Suswa. Mm. You, you'll be on that train. It's a railway to nowhere, and, and people still uh, don't want to agree to that. The, the president uh, argued that you know we're not just investing for today, in that mm. he said we're building this so that the understanding is that when these areas expand, these satellite towns, as they are calling them, mm. that you will not find the railway is already s fighting for space with uh, residential and other things because of the kind of cargo, you know, so, situation. So procurement-led project. Then, if you do a, pro a, a, a project that is led by need today in Nairobi, do you need a more efficient commuter uh, transport system? Do you need a, a, a bus system, um, uh, maybe uh, some some efficient um, uh, bus system that can bring people to Nairobi and back to work in the CBD? Or do you need a railway to Suswa that will, will be used another five years? People who are generating 40, 30 percent of the economy are here. So you need to, first of all, take care of this as an immediate need as you move to five years from now. I'm not saying it will not be useful in another five years, but now you are taking the ability of these people to work so they can go to pay more taxes, so that you can go to fund that infrastructure project. You've taken that away from them. Mm. So first, take care of this, get more money out of it, and look at, for instance, the, the thicker road. You know, this is, you know, these are practical examples. When you do a road, like uh, the, big, the big, big, big thicker road, what happened is that um, you find the value of land on that road more than tripled. Uh, you had big high-rise uh, buildings that came up, and there was a lot of economic activity that was there. Eventually, that immediately was reflected on the economy, one way or the other, because uh, those landlords are now having people staying in those houses, their shops coming up, their malls, and all that manner of things. And Mirai is coming to Nairobi faster than it used to. Now, that is a, a mix of a, a development that actually has a direct impact on the economy, and you can feel it. Now, think about the beautiful railway in terms of the economy, in terms of it is like 10 times more than what we did on how, what is the impact on the economy? So are we saying that there's no place for these larger investments in the meantime? L let me answer that. Yes. I, I think the biggest concept that especially people who draft these projects don't look at uh, is a, as a concept called like opportunity cost. Yes. If you're investing a railway from Nairobi to Naivasha at 150 billion, what else can you do with that amount in the economy? What impact can you have different from the railway. I can tell you that 150 billion is what you can build uh, a dual carriageway from Mombasa to Malaba. You look at the impact of those two, you cannot compare because the road to Mombasa to Malaba to Mombasa is one of the busiest roads in Eastern Central Africa. You look at the impact that you ha we can have on that, it's massive. Now, that's the, that's the thing that we tend to agree with, uh, especially when the president tries to say that uh, we are building for 10 years. 
Uh, yes, we are looking at 10 years. But the opportunity cost that you're denying people the needs today is heavy. So you're saying for now we should hold on the 10-year projects and first and fix do, the... And that's how you build an economy. You build an economy, it's like trying to repair a watch. You st one step and another, you move step to another. So by the time you're coming to consolidate everything, you are far much ahead. So you do small projects that have bigger impact. And the standards of living and quality of life improve. That's where you have a lot of income and taxes that you can do those bigger projects. But you cannot start climbing the tree from the top building bigger projects, expecting that you will catch them. Beatrice, do you agree with that? Do you feel that there is no space? I mean, we, should, we should first of all hold off on the long-term projects and first of all fix the, 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 the more immediate ones. Yeah, I, I really agree with that because, um, for example, if you look at, at that expressway, for example, and look at the, that phase two of the SGR going downwards to Suswa, these are projects, they are very useful, I agree, yes but they're not solving the problems we have now. So we'll still keep complaining about the bad economy, we'll keep complaining of a housing issue in Nairobi, because these are not, whatever is coming in is not solving our current problems. For example, look at housing, the housing problem. The government has been at least working on it through the Big Four agenda, but there's still more that needs to be done. If you look at manufacturing, there's still more that needs to be done. There's more uh, investment that needs to go into it. and those. Those, for example, those two um, initiatives or, or pillars of the Big Four agenda, they're likely to solve more problems than the SUSWA face of the SGR would solve. Not that it's not important, but is it solving the problems we have now? And if we don't solve them now, they don't stop. They keep expanding. So the we issue are, continues we've seen when the president going and, you know, the other day he was at, uh, I think, somewhere in Mavoko, uh, doing some houses. Um, we've seen a number of projects which have said been brought up for the uh, housing agenda. So are we seeing that this is still insufficient, for instance, on the housing end, for instance? Yeah, if you look at the housing deficit, uh, according to the National Housing Corporation, stood at 2 million and grows every year by 250,000 units. Uh, whatever we are supplying is still very low compared to what we need. So the housing deficit is still there. And given the changing times, the growing population, look at our census, uh, the result of our census, we've grown uh, I think by around 2.6%. So meaning the demand for housing is still there. What is being supplied is not good enough. Okay. Uh, the projects that have finished, they've, they've launched several projects, but how many of those have finished yet? Okay. So we're still very far. We'll get back to, to this conversation just a bit where we'll now look at is there anyone who is happy in this economy? Because the, the, the feeling here is like there's no one who is happy. <laughs> we need to speak some hope if there is. So we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that when we, when we come back after the break. Take a short break on NTV today. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back. I, I, with this in just a bit.